All right, welcome everybody. We are going to give it just a minute while people get logged in. Uh, we are all glad that you're you're joining us today. Um, as I said, we'll give it just a minute to let people get settled in and then we'll get started. All right. Uh, thank you all for joining us. My name is Rob Lewis. I am on the uh, a member of the AZA Safety Committee and the uh, the vice chair of the AZA Safety Summit Subcommittee. Uh, and we want to welcome you to Drills 101. Uh, this is an extension of the uh, AZA mid-year uh, themes, so to speak. Um, you know, given the limitations of a of an all virtual uh, Zoom based safety summit, uh, we had some things that we really wanted to discuss that didn't exactly fit into that format or time frame. So um, we're trying this what we're calling an off cycle webinar. Uh, so we do appreciate you joining. It looks like we've got about seventy five or more people so far, and so that's really exciting for us. Um, just logistically to let you know, um, you are all in. Uh, View or a listen only mode and, and view only mode. Uh, so your cameras and microphones are not on. Um, we are or have disabled the chat function, but we are watching the Q&A. So as we go through, if you have a question about uh, anything that you hear or see, uh, feel free to drop a question in the Q&A. We will be watching it throughout and we will leave some time at the end to get to everybody's questions. So um, again, we do appreciate you coming. Uh, and, yeah, and joining us. And with that, I will turn it over to Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for joining us for AZA Drills 101. My name is Kelly Murphy. I am the ES EMS coordinator at the North Carolina Zoo. And joining me is Jeff Halter, who is the VP of Animal Care and the HR. Um, we're really excited to present this to you. And take it away, Jeff. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. It wouldn't, no, I'm unmuted. Perfect. Um, just double checking that I'm unmuted. Um, the first thing you're going to see is a disclaimer. Um, any good safety person will tell you that you need a disclaimer and probably a spotter at the same time. And so I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds to read this. Basically, uh, what we're saying here is that uh, none of this material is, um, we're not saying we're subject matter experts. We're just sharing some example practices with you today um, on things that we have uh, identified that help our institutions uh, be able to uh, conduct and record our drills. Um, so please make sure that you read the full disclaimer. Um, it's on all of our uh, safety materials. And so um, if you have access to the example practice document, you'll see um, that same disclaimer on there. All right, so let's get started. We're going to cover a couple of things today. The first thing I want to tell you is that there are resources that are available to you. So there's the zoo and aquarium example practice document um, that is on the AZA safety network um, that you can get. It's a, a pretty robust document um, that covers a lot of things. If you haven't read it, I would definitely um, spend your weekend reading through that. It's a nice, easy read. Um, and then there's the AZA safety network where you can engage in a lot of the members of the safety committee um, that have varied backgrounds. Um, other safety committee members. And then today we're going to be talking a little bit about um, NIMS, the National Incident Emergency Management System, um, and then the FEMA Federal Emergency Management um, Agency that has a lot of online training that can help beef up some of the um, knowledge, skills, and abilities that you might need um, to develop in order to conduct effective training exercises. Um, those resources are out there for you. We'll just highlight them a little bit throughout the presentation, but we're not going to be teaching you about NIMS or FEMA. Our goals for today are to do an overview of what's required for institutions um, as, as they relate to their drills. We're going to review tools for developing uh, effective scenarios. Um, and documenting those. And then we're gonna explore different techniques for conducting training exercises. We're actually going to play a game in about a half an hour from now. And so I hope that everybody stays around because I think that that game um, is surprisingly fun and there's a lot to be learned from that. And then we're gonna review uh, documentation practices. 
All right. So the first thing is that we all know um, and probably could uh, probably have looked at uh, standard 1125, which is the quick complete language for the uh, live action uh, emergency drills. When I talk about emergency exercises and drills, I like to think of six training exercises. We always talk, we usually talk about four. We talk about fire, uh, weather, or some kind of environmental exercise, an injury to a guest or visitor. Um, and then we talk about animal escape. Um, but there's two other ones that are in the uh, accreditation standards that you should make sure that you're aware of. And those um, are around dive operations. And so there's standard 1174, um, which talks about uh, dive, um, dive training exercises. And then there's one for venomous animals, if you have venomous animals in your collection, and that's 11.5.2. And there's some of that other language um, down there from them that we pulled out if you wanna take some time to read that. Um, but there are the four uh, required exercises plus those other two that I talked about um, that are required. And so um, just make sure that you're thinking about all of the exercises that you need to do. One of the difficult things for accreditation is you can't go back in time and do these exercises. They need to happen annually. And so uh, thinking ahead can be very helpful. When we, when we think about documentation in the example practice document, there is, um, there is a form that can help you uh, record some of your training exercises. It's also um, a nice document to uh, start from it as you're trying to figure out um, what the goals of your exercise are. And so here's an example of uh, one way um, to document your exercise. I'm going to show you a different way in just a couple of seconds here. Um, but you can see that there's some important things um, that are on here, like who are the list of participants that are there? Um, was incident command used? What are the weather conditions? You're going to hear all of that same stuff in just a couple of seconds. All right, so um, I used to work for Disney's Animal Kingdom and was responsible for doing uh, training exercises for all of the um, all of the satellite locations. So Animal Kingdom, Animal Kingdom Lodge, Tricircle D Ranch, um, and uh, the Living Seas, those kinds of areas. You can imagine that it's hard to teach everyone how to effectively conduct a training exercise. Um, and it was impractical for me to be at all of those places. So probably about 15 years ago, um, with a team of really bright people from Animal Kingdom, we started to build a scenario development tool. And that's what we're going to show you today. Um, the most important thing that comes from it is that um, it's really important to identify your exercise goals up front. If you don't know what your exercise goals are, um, I don't know how you effectively conduct an exercise. Um, I define the goals and then start to build the scenario that sets up um, what we want to test or uh, what we want to train. So you'll see in there that we'll do goal setting that moves us to scenario development. Then we'll talk about tabletop exercise. Um, you might do what I would call an operational exercise um, if needed. And this could be uh, exercises that maybe you need to test something like your firearms response time. So if we've, we've probably all conducted drills that happen really fast. Um, and so you have an animal, a dangerous animal out um, and uh, everyone knows that you're going to do the exercise on Tuesday and everybody magically happens to be very close to the firearm safe. And, um, and so the response time is skewed. Um, maybe you have a plan, planned evacuation for your, for your park um, or a zoo or aquarium. And uh, you know, on the day that you test it, um, you know, they're able to execute it minutes faster um, or the response time to uh, clearing the park um, for a lost child. And so some of those things, those operational exercises can help establish a better time reference and also give you a little bit more practice on some of the important functions that you might do in a full scale or functional exercise. 
The next one is functional exercise. This is the one that counts for accreditation. This is the live action exercise um, that we're all familiar with where um, we're um, playing out a fire, uh, weather related events, an animal escape, um, a diver or some kind of um, animal envenomation. And then um, the documentation uh, for all of that is super critical. You definitely wanna get credit for all of the hard work that you're doing around your training exercises or drills. And, um, and so documenting is, is a very important part of that. Um, so I also think that when you set up a process and that you uh, have a good process for how you're going to do it, it also helps lead you through uh, doing your training exercises. So uh, here at Shine Mountain Zoo, we have an emergency response team or ERT and we have a meeting and uh, every month. And the setup of that meeting is uh, such that we debrief whatever training exercise we did the prior month. This uh, ERT meeting happens at the end of each month. And so we do training on policies and review policies that would be applicable to the next exercise, which usually happens in the next month, which is literally like a week later. We do any tabletop exercises that we might want to do um, prior to doing the training exercise in the following month. Um, and, then, um, and then again, we do that, that training exercise or drill uh, literally a couple of uh, weeks later. And then we'll recap that um, so that everybody can debrief on what we learned from that training exercise at the next one. And so that works really well for us. I'm not suggesting that every uh, zoo or aquarium should do that, but thinking about how you set yourself up for success and how it lends to the entire process, I think is an important and a uh, key feature of what we're gonna talk about today. So when I talk about scenario development, um, the reason that the tool was developed is that we would have lots of people doing training exercises um, in their area um, but no way to like really collect the information in a very succinct way and no real process for developing a scenario that was helpful for people who maybe didn't have, um, have training in, in putting together an exercise. So we always say that we start with exercise goals um, because we want to build our scenario to test those goals. If we don't know the goals, I don't know how we build the scenario in order to test it. So there's some examples on here of exercise goals that we use for an animal escape. So we wanna test our IC structure. We wanna see um, if the IC is paying attention and takes over the scene. We wanna see if the IC um, appropriately allocates staff towards the uh, incident commands um, structure. Um, we want to see if there's positive identification of, in this case, tigers. So did we see where all of the tigers are? Do we know how many tigers we have? Um, what was the firearms response time? Um, and how do we resolve uh, these situations after they, after they um, are completed? And so this is a small list of things that we thought we would just share with you about how you would identify some exercise goals before Starting to, um, starting to develop your scenario. Um, then, um, um, then one thing that I'm gonna recommend is that you might say, oh, you might fabricate some uh, fantastic way that an animal gets out of the out of the exhibit or into secondary containment or whatever you're looking to test. Um, and I would only do that when it is pertinent to it. So like um, we might not want our documents to suggest that uh, there was a keeper error that let um, a cat out, but we might wanna test that scenario. And so in that, I would just say a keeper finds the cat out. I don't think we need to identify that. It's not part of um, what we need to test in our scenario. But you could imagine if, uh, if a dangerous animal had a escape path through some Carlos mesh or something like that, that that might be important because it would help dictate how you approach the situation. Um, and so then I would include that. 
So those are just some notes on um, things that you might want to include and things that uh, might be extraneous that you might just want to leave out of the documentation, especially if you're an institution that is foiable um, or has um, some kind of open records request laws, they could ask for these documents. And so I might just be a little bit careful about what you put in them. So as you move through the um, developing your exercise, um, or your scenario, then you move right into their tabletop exercise. There's a slide on here. I'm going to just jump back. So sorry, it says uh, drills and exercises. Is it semantics? In, in a way it is, um, but I like to think of a training exercise as something that's known that's going to happen um, where we're testing our team on the skills that, they, that they've that they been trained to and making sure they're ready. So my very first, um, my very first uh, structure fire exercise might look like on Tuesday, we're going to have a fire drill for this building. Here's some things that you might need to know. What are your escape routes? Um, stand up and leave, close doors behind you, um, make sure that you check exits, take people with you, um, and then move to your assembly area. And then I would train people on that, and then I would execute the training exercise. For me, even though it's semantics, the word drill means that I wouldn't tell them what was going to happen. Um, I would expect that they'd already been trained during the training exercise. I would walk into the building, pull the fire alarm, and then I would see if everyone, um, everyone um, executed the fire plan in the right way and then give notes. So for me, training exercise and drills uh, mean two different things, um, but they may not mean two different things to you. And I would just encourage you to make sure that you're doing your training exercise before you're doing your drill to make sure that your staff feels comfortable um, and has the knowledge, skills, and ability and some practice around conducting um, that particular exercise. So then when you move on to the tabletop exercise, you could talk about, um, uh, you could play out how those things would work um, either in the field or in a room, um, but you would wanna document some, some pretty important things like who is in attendance, the key players, and then you would want to make sure that you had brought your exercise goals from your scenario development from the scenario over to your training exercise in the tabletop exercise and that you could check off the ones that you were able to accomplish. Then you could talk about the ones that you were that you didn't accomplish in that exercise in that uh, tabletop exercise. Here at the bottom, you'll see that there's some notes on uh, some definitions. This is from Homeland Security Exercise and Evaluation Program, that's the HSEEP, and they have a lot of um, documents out there that you can review, uh, but we pulled the terminology from that group uh, from Department of Homeland Security. And so in this, it says that a tabletop exercise involves personnel simulating a scenario um, in a formal set, informal setting, um, and you're talking about your policies and procedures when you're doing that. Moving on to the operational exercise, I had suggested that you might want to do this around firearms. So um, sometimes I'll run um, a firearms um, operational exercise um, two or three times. Uh, maybe their response time is like three minutes to the first one. Uh, maybe the conditions on the next day um, or a weekend might be different. And so that'd be five minutes. And then maybe I run one more um, and I average those times together. Then when I'm doing my, my functional exercise, the one that's required for AZA, um, sometimes what happens is your firearms team will get to the location right away. They're there in like 45 seconds. And you know that that's probably not the accurate time. You have that average of four minutes. And so you can just tell that group, hey, I'm glad you got here um, really early, but you can't engage into the scenario until we hit the four minute mark. That's the average that it takes us in order to um, in order to get you guys here. Again, you'll see the HSEEP definition of the operational exercise. And it just goes to help um, inform um, uh, information to your larger exercise. So then the functional exercise, um, and you could skip that optional exercise, the um, the operational exercise, you could skip that um, if it wasn't pertinent, um, if you didn't need it. And so uh, frequently we do that. Um, but in order to 
prompt you to go through all of the phases. Um, we leave it in there each time and just say that we opted to not do an operational exercise. The full scale um, or functional exercise, um, again, is the one that counts for AZA. And this is the culmination of all of the work that you've done um, in the scenario development tool up into this point. So you've created a scenario, looked at your um, uh, looked at your goals, you've done your tabletop exercise, you may have supplemented some information with your operational exercise. And this is the game day um, training exercise that that you're that you're going to do. And this um, could incorporate um, emergency responders from outside. It could be um, it could be smaller scale for just your your zoo um, or aquarium. Um, and uh, this is the documentation that you would need for um, um, for the for the full scale exercise. I like to also in each section add things that we learned as we move through the process, but also identify other things. You'll see that there's a changes to operating guidelines or local documentation. Um, it's really easy to just go ahead and identify those changes that you need to make to that documentation up front. Um, and then at a later date, you can go through and make those adjustments. So you have your list of participants, um, high level uh, things that you wanted to pull out of that. And then the detailed, um, like almost minute by minute is the detailed exercise summary. All right, the last part in AZA, it says that um, drills must be recorded and the results evaluated for a compliance with emergency procedures. So that's actually in the standard. And it's a piece that, um, that I think that there's a lot of opportunity around. And so we just have a whole other section, uh, phase five, that just details some of the um, recap of um, all of the all of the entire exercise in its entirety. All right, so let's recap really quick. We want to focus on goal setting. So we need to know what we need to test before we develop our scenario. Then we need to know uh, how would we know if we were successful. So those are some of those things that we would test. We would develop the scenario um, from the goals, and then we'd conduct our operational exercise if needed. Then we'd conduct our conduct our functional exercise. That's the one that's required for AZA, and then we do our analysis of that. I want to talk about one last thing, and that's planning out your drills. Um, and uh, there's a little uh, by way of example uh, lesson that, that I have here. Um, at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, uh, we plan for winter. Um, Colorado is, uh, has heavy snow season um, in the winter. And we had originally planned our um, power outage drill and our uh, cold weather exercise um, in October. If you're uh, like many uh, zoos, you probably do a boo at the zoo or some kind of holiday lights. Um, and a lot of our staff was tied up in the setup of that. And so it was difficult to schedule that in October. And so we moved that training exercise to September. It's really important to think about what kind of exercises you need to do and the timing that you need to do those exercises to make sure that your institution is set up for success. So we wanna make sure that we do that uh, training exercise and that we're ready as we move into winter months. And so planning out your exercises is one way to ensure that you're going to have your institution ready for whatever the next emergency is. Um, here in Colorado, it's also pretty dry and we do a wildland fire exercise. We also do a structure fire exercise and we always do the wildland fire exercise um, sometime in June or July. That's when um, wildfire season starts. And so having our staff uh, practiced and ready for those exercises as we move into those different seasons can be really helpful. I would recommend that you have 12 exercises a year. That may seem a little ambitious um, uh, or at least six exercises a year um, that are scheduled out um, so that you can uh, make sure that you're testing your protocols and that you're effectively training your staff in order to be able to conduct um, whatever emergency operations might be needed at the time. With that, I am going to pass us off to um, the talented Kelly Murphy. She's gonna walk us through, um, through a really fun game 
And uh, that game will probably last about a half an hour. And then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Um, and so I'll kick it over to you, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so first and foremost, um, I want to go ahead and acknowledge that this game actually came from Rick Holsworth at the Jacksonville Zoo. Um, it was something that he had been working on for quite some time. He introduced it to me and I made some tweaks and revisions for a association of zookeepers conference. Um, it taught me a lot and it taught everybody else in the room a lot. So we have kind of expanded it a little bit more. Um, so virtual, it has been really hard. I'm sure everybody knows with Zoom calls and trying to kind of get everything moving and trying to figure out a way to do drills. I have found that I can do, I did two drills like this, um, playing this game and also trying to get people engaged as far as drills are concerned. So it actually worked out really well. Um, basically what's gonna happen is we're gonna go ahead and you would assign roles to diff different participants. The best outcome that I have seen is when we have taken keepers and put them in the role of incident command and other security personnel and put them in the roles of keepers. It's been a huge help, it's been an eye opener and it started some really valuable conversations. Um, you're gonna have a lot of different groups in the same room to do the exercise, which is really helpful. They all can have conversations and work through it together. Um, and the game is played by rolling a dice. Um, it will give you a screen, you will have a screen to tell you what each number means and then it will go ahead and um, have discussions based on what you have. The things, some of the questions that you want to, to look at are how different did each table outcome change? What were the things that were common between the groups and what things were different between the groups? Um, for the sake of this drill, we are going to run through the first couple of roles. Um, you would really wanna pay more attention and put a little bit more time and thought process into these. Um, but for the sake of time, we're gonna go ahead and do this. Um, one thing I would also like to point out is there's different developments as we go along. As Jeff said, putting down goals for your exercise, this is the perfect place to put different developments to coincide with the goal that you're looking for. So without further ado, it's not letting me, Jeff, I'm sorry. Perfect. I'll, just do, I'll just do it for you. You can just Thank like. Thank you. Um, so again, you're just gonna roll the dice. Uh, after each roll, compare the number to the number on the slide, discuss your thoughts, and each member has a few minutes to get their point across. That's the most important thing. Um, without further ado, we rolled a one. So it's gonna be Sunday morning before 9 a.m. Great. Um, so most people are gonna go ahead and think about how many guests are in the park? Where are most of your guests? How many staff do you have for each of the roles and responsibilities? And what is other staff, staff doing around the park? Um, for, this, for this, we have um, Rob Lewis, uh, who's gonna be incident command, Dan, who's gonna be firearms team, Dave, who's gonna be guest services, Jeff, who's gonna be animal operations manager, and Andrew, who's gonna be public information officer. Uh, next screen, Jeff. Let's see what animal we get. Yay. Yay. <laughs> the reason why this is so funny is because we did that for our practice run and no one was really thrilled about chimpanzees. Um, I personally was excited about it. So well, again, you're going to have to ask yourself, what is the threat to the public? What protocols and actions are different based on the species? What natural behavior of the species? And where is the enclosure located? So we're gonna go ahead and go to the next slide as well. And it's a five. So in the development, like I said, this will help you further with your goals. Um, number five is into a guest area towards north end of the zoo. So now I'm gonna go ahead and let the guys run through their roles as to what they'd be doing during this process. Rob? Thanks, Kelly. Um, the first thing I want to just mention before um, before we dive in that, that we learned as we were doing this in preparation is, you know, we all come from different institutions. We are not sitting in the same institution operating under the same protocols, um, which actually generated a lot of great discussion. 
but something to remember as we're going through this uh, is is that you know these are meant to generate discussion and thought, um, and so we may say some things that may be different than what you would do in your institution, and that's okay. Um, it's all part of the process. So um, I'm at Disney. At Disney, if we had an animal like that get out. Um, you know, the first thing that as an incident commander that I would do is, is touch base with what we call the recovery coordinator, uh, which is the individual with the most experience with that species that is in a leadership role. Um, that's how we define that. And um, we would also uh, notify the firearms team and have them uh, staged by the safe at, the, at our gun safe at the very beginning of the incident. At this point, if we knew the animal was moving towards guest areas uh, and further into the zoo, then we obviously would have deployed the firearms team. Uh, and at that time, they would end up under the direction of the recovery coordinator. Uh, at Disney, the incident command is, is largely a communication conduit between what's happening on the ground and the recovery coordinator and the rest of our partners, law enforcement, senior leadership, et cetera. So, um, that's where we would be at this point. Dan? Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, even though we all sort of dreaded the chimpanzee scenario, uh, I just have to say I really like chimpanzees. Don't take that wrong, anyone. Um, they're amazing animals. Uh, we do not have chimpanzees at the Cincinnati Zoo, so I don't fully understand all of their uh, potential. I just know I, from history and what I have heard from other incidents, what they're capable of um, being highly intelligent um, and uh, agile and mobile. So the first thing we would do, I would have my ear to that radio. Uh, once we got the call that uh, we were being called out, uh, a code Houdini, I would be listening and asking for information while going to my safe. I would choose the appropriate weapon. In this case, I would since we don't have chimpanzee, I would choose our 12 gauge pump shotguns, load it, have it on safety, ready to go if I was activated. And at that point in our case, we would go to uh, proceed to the scene and be on the radio telling the incident commander that I am on my way to the scene and waiting for their instructions at that point. Because they might say to us, we've had uh, two other uh, dark team members respond, stand uh, stand by or stand off, form a perimeter and let those other two move in. So it's going to be a first come first served kind of uh, scenario. Whoever is on the scene first is going to be the responders and the rest of us would hold back because you don't want too many guns in the area. There's, there's safety risk in that. I think that's it. Okay. So from a guest services aspect, uh, the first thing we would do would be lock down the entry gates and then um, at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, we always have a designated crowd control person um, and the guest services team would assist the crowd control team with basically getting guests to safety with uh, an animal um, moving into the guest area. The, the call, the immediate call is going to be to get guests into buildings and into safety. So that would really be the role of the guest services at that point. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Jeff? Um, I guess my very first thing is um, trying to get a better situational awareness of what is actually happening. So um, I'd want to ask good questions to whoever spotted this animal um, and the keeper team to find out, is it one animal that's out um, or is it uh, multiple animals that are out? Um, hopefully, we don't have chimps that uh, at China Mountain Zoo, but I have worked with them before. Um, many great apes have emergency recall training. And so the very first thing that I would try to do is uh, engage emergency recall training, um, uh, recall to see if we could uh, get that animal to stop moving in the direction of guests and start moving back into a safe direction. Um, the next thing that I would be looking for is uh, some kind of uh, behavioral explanation of why this animal got out. Um, sometimes animals find themselves out of enclosures and they want to get back in. Um, and sometimes there's social pressure because of group dynamics um, for chimpanzees that might push an animal out of the group. 
Um, my response uh, may change dramatically depending on the individual animal and my assessment of the behavior that that animal is exhibiting. Since we rolled the dice number five and it's moving towards a guest area, I'm going to assume that um, for this scenario that it's an animal that's been pushed out of the group and that it's unlikely that emergency recall is going to pull that animal back unless I can get the rest of the troop uh, secured in the building. Um, and then, um, but I would still do emergency training or recall training or emergency recall to get the rest of the animals secured in the building so that I could have good situational awareness of what all of the, what all of the moving parts are. So I think um, those would be the first things that I would start to be thinking of. The next piece of that is the coordination with firearms team. So uh, chimps are brilliant animals. They know what a firearm looks like. Many of them have been darted or have had, um, or had some experience with uh, vet team uh, and or things that look like guns. Um, and so um, in this situation, I would try to get um, somebody who uh, knew the individual animal paired up with, um, with a firearms member so that they could get close to the situation but had some protection to be able to give good situational awareness to, um, to what was going on in the situation. But again, trying to keep that firearms member um, in a position where uh, the firearm didn't continue to escalate the situation. Thank you, Jeff. Andrew? So at this point, it's obviously um, getting more information so that we can um, prepare a statement. Um, hopefully, this is a situation that has started internally and has not hit um, any police dispatching radios or anything like that, because the media is very much um, listening and will hound us as soon as they hear something. Um, that's happened to me plenty of times where the first time I hear it is because a reporter called me and said, oh, this is happening at your zoo. And I'm thinking, oh, well, thank you for that. Nobody knows that this happened. So um, the first thing is to contact you know, operations, security, contact animal care to find out what is going on so that we can have a baseline um, to begin to think about how we're going to, um, to push forward the kind of messaging that we want. Um, we want to make sure that we have a holding in, uh, holding statement, something that we can put out really quickly so that the media is satisfied at least for an hour or two. Um, a lot of times we don't want to give too much information and we do not want to um, uh, give too little. Um, it, it's kind of a balancing act and um, there is no hard science to this. Um, so the first one is drafting a statement. Um, I normally like to go back and use older uh, messaging or find older statement that is relevant to this topic. So if you, if we have a, a, a chimp, which the San Diego does not have chimpanzees, but if we had a primate that escaped at some point, well, I wanna go back and I wanna look at what we said at that time um, of that primate escape to try to uh, make sure our messaging is consistent overall with our brand, make sure it's consistent with our um, conservation messaging and everything that comes uh, in play there. Um, information that I'm going to need off the bat is obviously the location of where the animal is at that present time, uh, the safety of guests. Um, I believe uh, we talked about that guests were evacuated in that area. So we want to make sure that has happened. We definitely need to know the safety of the animal. It, um, you know, is the animal in an area that they, it, it could get hurt? Um, it, it, is there potential of it moving to another area that it could get hurt? So we want to make sure um, that uh, that is talked about. And also, do we have any idea of how it happened? Um, we would not give that information to the public right away, but we do wanna make sure that we have that in our mind because that is going to be the next question um, that's following up about, oh, this happened. Well, how did that happen? Um, so those are the initial thoughts behind what we're doing. Um, at that point, I'm sitting at my desk, like I said, um, drafting something small and waiting as long as I can to make sure I have all the relevant information. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, would anybody else like to make any other further comments, questions? I, I would. I, I think I want to just 
riff off of Jeff there a little bit and that comment that he made about uh, chimps knowing what a firearm looks like. And that's really, really important because uh, the response of a, a gun team member or a lethal force team member to a scene, the scene like that could just make it worse. Um, and so we have to be super discreet. And, and that's why that information flow to the, the all members of the team, um, whether you're lethal or not, is super important. So uh, I, I think that's that's like not something to gloss over. And you didn't, Jeff. I'm really glad you said something. But I want to reinforce it because some species, the presence of a firearm can just make it worse. I was just noting that um, none of us actually have chimpanzees in our current collection, unless you do, Kelly. Um, we do. So you, oh, good. You picked the hardest one for the rest of us. Because <laughs> I like you guys so much. OK. Um, with that being said, if anyone has any other comments? No? OK, we're going to go ahead and roll again. It is a two. So two, guests are within close proximity of the escaped animal. So we're basically asking questions about their natural behavior. How does this change the incident and, the, and your individual response? And what is the rest of the staff doing? Those are usually questions that we end up bringing to the table when we have these discussions. Um, we will go ahead and start with Rob again. OK, so uh, at this point, I am relying on our recovery coordinator to provide me with information from the scene uh, regarding what kind of perimeter has been set, um, what they need in terms of resources, if they need more, uh, more staff to tighten the perimeter, uh, if they need to move people out of there, if they need additional um, you know, keeper or animal care staff to respond and attempt to recover the animal. Um, they also are guiding our firearms team. Uh, again, as, the, as the, the boots on the ground, so to speak, um, they're the ones with the eyes on the scene. Um, and the incident command at this point is in discussions with, um, you know, our leadership in the park. Um, for us to close the park is a, is a massive undertaking. Um, and so that would involve uh, discussions with our senior leadership and senior leadership of park operations, um, they, you know, which have probably started prior to this, as soon as the animal was moving close, you know, towards guests. Um, but obviously those discussions are getting more intense now if the animal is in a close proximity to guests. Um, and, you know, we're also providing direction to our, um, you know, our merchandise and our food and beverage partners. Uh, to encourage people to shelter in place and, and get people to safety. So um, all that is happening uh, through our incident command center. Um, and as I said, the, on the scene, the recovery coordinator is directing all of the efforts there. Great. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Dan, firearms? Uh, yeah, this is, I don't like number two. Oh. Uh, at all. All right, Kelly. Yeah, thanks. Uh, so it really depends on the ground report, uh, what's happening on the ground. And if, 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 let's say if I'm there and I see what's happening, it, it sort of depends on what's happening at that point. Um, if we use our incident commander is usually on the ground, so it's sort of playing the role of the, the I forgot the term you use, Rob. Uh, for the recovery person. coordinator is what we recovery call it. Recovery coordinator, yeah. So uh, we would probably see what's happening there. If they're in close proximity and there's imminent threat, then I think a decision would have to be made to take a shot. If there's things happening, there's aggression and bad things are happening, it, it's not a discussion, it just happens as quickly as you can safely take a shot. Um, because time is of the essence and, and uh, a human life is in jeopardy. Um, this is the, there's, I need more information. Bottom line is information, 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 especially for those that are on the, the, in the position of, of taking action and as part of our man, mandate to take action on the, uh, to, to preserve human life, frankly, and the life of other animals. Um, so this is, this is all sort of situation, it's dependent on the situation and you can hear me struggling inside, right? Everybody can see it. It's, it's like one of those moments of like, oh, this is not not a great scenario. It could be worse only if I was told the animal was on somebody at that point. But 
it's in the nuance. If it's not doing anything and there doesn't seem to be a threat, no need to act. Let's see if we can get somebody in there uh, from the, the vet team and dart this animal while covering the dark team, the, the person with the dart gun. Uh, that is the lethal force team is covering the person with the dart rifle and then covering the people that are in close proximity as well, just in case the animal responds poorly to being darted. It's, it's, and these are not forgiving conditions to be in at all. Um, the ability to respond in microseconds is tough, but that's what's required. That's what's required. So that's, that's where our training comes in and our proficiency comes in. And that's why it's important to have highly proficient, well-trained, familiar people on the lethal force team. All right, enough, thanks. I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> that was nice, Dan, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry, Dan. I, I really didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> But I appreciate your open, honest answer. That's a huge help to people, I think. Um, Dave? Yeah, thank you. And you, you handled that really well, Dan. You're right. That is one of the, the worst um, roles that this one could be. It's also worse for the guest services side of it. Um, at this point, we're listening to the radio. We're, we're getting guests to shelter in place. But just by the definition of the role of the dice, some of the guests are probably trying to take videos of what's going on and then put themselves in harm's way, harm's way which then puts the guest um, experience staff and the um, crowd control staff in, in that place where they got to make hard decisions, just like the firearms team. How far do they go to help guests before they're putting themselves in harm's way? So it's, it's really a fine line with how far you can go um, and you don't want to interfere with the other response. You want to make sure you're, you're creating a, 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 like a perimeter at a safe enough distance so that you're not allowing more guests to put themselves in harm's way. Uh, but you really have to stay tuned to the radio and be alert to what's happening. Um, if the situation changes, you need to be able to get yourself as well as any guests inside that are not already inside. And I think really that's it. The next goes to that animal animal operations needs to get that recall working. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Nice segue. Yeah. Um, yeah. From an animal operations manager standpoint, um, again, I'll just say like this is you know if you're wondering if we had planned this out, we didn't. Um, this is all just live. Um, and uh, so we're reacting to it in the moment um, as you would be. Um, and so for me, I think the very first thing that I'm going to be looking at is the behavior of the animal and trying to figure out um, if there's anything that would help uh, change this situation. So like, is there a background music that I can get turned off? Is there a ride or attraction that I could get uh, turned off to like, try to uh, de-escalate um, this situation. So I'd be looking at kind of what those antecedents are in the environment that could help um, this animal move in a different direction. And then I'm probably next really focused on what other things can I put in between um, an animal and a guest. So I might be able to move a guest. I might be able to take a vehicle and put between them. I might be able to, um, to figure out some other arrangement that would allow me to, um, that would allow me to uh, be able to kind of de-escalate this situation. But I think that Dan is absolutely right. Uh, what we need to try to assess in this situation is what is the potential danger um, to uh, human life. And in this one, um, an animal uh, the size of a chimpanzee uh, moving in close proximity to guests is is one of those things that I think um, makes all of our hair stand up because um, it could turn out to be a potentially dangerous situation for for them. Knowing that 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 human humans in close proximity to a chimpanzee also creates a situation where uh, Dan may not be able to take that shot, um, and so I might have to do something else. Um, which might actually escalate the situation. So then the next things that I start to think about is, you know, I, I thought about removing 
uh, sound and uh, elements from the environment, but then I might also start to think about would I introduce those to the environment in a different direction. So would I go towards the guests and have an air horn or a fire extinguisher or something like that? Or would I move the firearms person um, into that position so that the chimpanzee could see that and be like, oh, I want to move away from that. I might be able to change the antecedent arrangement um, of the situation such that I could get the animal to move away from the guests. Um, and so those would be some of the things that I would start thinking about um, in that situation. Wow, that's a really great answer, Jeff. That was really, that brought a lot of different things to the table too. Um, Andrew. So um, apart from recall and looking at all of those numbers, every number besides six sucks when it comes to PR. Absolutely sucks. Um, the only reason why six is a good thing is really because I'm in San Diego and because if it rains here, even a little speck, it becomes, it's like a tsunami or a typhoon or a hurricane here. And they go crazy with team coverage that it rained and everybody is all bonkers and crazy and crashing into each other. So six works because it pulls focus away. The other ones, especially um, if Dan decides to take the shot, ruins my day or my entire year. So um, at this point, PR is sitting there like, please recall, please have this animal go back. Um, we, we wouldn't say anything at this point because quite frankly, there really isn't anything to say. Um, the only concern I would have would be visual concern. So um, first, uh, for some reason, um, news media has, doesn't have money for a lot of things, but when it comes to something like this, they all of a sudden have money to put up a helicopter. And so that helicopter could be circling around watching all of the stuff happening on the ground and seeing our uh, staff members with rifles or with any kind of uh, um, weapon or ready to dart the animal. And it, it, while it could be a dart and it's not something that could be lethal, um, it looks bad in the, in, in the eyes of other folks because they're not really, they're just using it from their own emotion and they're not really seeing the practical aspects and the things that all of you as professionals know. Um, so that's my first thought. My second thought is if this animal is moving closer to guests, um, you're right, what is the perimeter? Because are they in visual side of the animal? If they're in visual side of the animal, that means their phones are in visual side of the animal. Um, and that brings a whole new element to, uh, to this scenario because uh, while a story could be great, you know, a story's good, you hear a story, you're like, oh, wow, that sounds interesting. Um, visuals are king. Video is king. And so um, if something happens and we're talking about this, um, that visual ham hampers a little bit of the discussion when it comes to media. However, if there is a, um, if there's a lot of activity and a guest has filmed this, it becomes a whole new situation. Um, you guys already all heard about the elephant in the habitat, uh, the elephant with the person in the habitat with their toddlers at the zoo, at the San Diego Zoo. That became a huge story, not only because somebody was in the zoo, but because there was a very dramatic video that was put online where media picked up on that. And while we were able to contain certain things in the onset, that video just added fuel to the fire. And then it became another three days of trying to deal with that situation because now we have visual and dramatic video of, of the event. Um, another thing that I heard um, with other experts here work was about closing the park. Now that becomes another big issue. That's a little bit more immediate than it, uh, talking specifically about the animal or you know where the animal is and, and things like that because now we're we're basically saying that this is important enough and this is dangerous enough where we have to do this. And closing is a really major deal, at least for us it is. And so it, it brings a connotation to the entire uh, situation that's happening. Um, but it also requires a lot of logistical communication. So it requires PR communications for media. Then it requires customer service communication then it requires membership communication and, and our website and all of that. So um, I would probably, if that is an idea or that's going to happen, immediately jump on trying to uh, draft something 
that can begin um, putting all of that together because we want consistent messaging between all of those different departments and elements of, of, um, of communication. Thank you, Andrew. So it's interesting to hear the different, um, Andrew, if I could just ask you, so if the scenario changes from, you know, obviously moment to moment, but the closure changes the whole entire dynamics, is that kind of how PI, PR works in that aspect? Yes, so the idea is when it comes to PR, PR and it comes to uh, thinking about that, we're, I try to go at it, um, and by, like I said, this is not a hard science, right? You guys deal with hard sciences. I'm communication. I'm in communication. So, um, my thought process behind PR is to always think about what media and the viewers are thinking. I try not to make it from inside out, more outside in, because then I'm able to to be able to respond appropriately. So, uh, a lot of the times we, when when we try to communicate to the public. We're coming at it from everything that we know in our minds. And sometimes we forget that the public knows none of the things that we know. They're coming from it in a completely different mindset. So in my mind, if I'm not a person who's working at the zoo and I'm sitting in my living room and I'm getting the, the, the text or I'm getting the video and, and the news report um, and we're like an animal escape and the zoo is closing, to me, that's like, wow, okay, so you have to close the zoo for this? And especially for San Diego Zoo, who doesn't close except for major events. Um, we've only closed less than 10 or something around their times in the entire 100 year history of the zoo. So at least when it comes to the San Diego public and our members to say that we're closing the zoo for an animal escape, which we've had that before, we've never did, uh, means that it's a very severe issue. And so now we have to speak about why is it so severe that we're closing it and we're adding that connotation to the overall uh, um, uh, event and overall situation. Okay, thank you. Um, anybody wanna make any comments based on everything we've just discussed? No? Nope. You, know, you know me, just really <laughs> quickly guys, uh, sorry. Okay. But there's some things to think about here, uh, especially uh, as I as I was listening to everyone, if we did have to take a shot, and the thing that I have to be very, I want everyone to understand this is that we need to know where everybody is. That communication piece. I need to know where my other team members are. I need to know where anyone in the park may be. And if the park is open or we haven't gotten all the people out, I need to know what my backstop is so that I can safely take a shot. Then you throw into the uh, mix the fact that chimps are arboreal. <sighs> and it could be up in a tree. Uh, I can't take that shot um, because the bullet will likely overpenetrate and continue on and come down someplace. And, I'm, and we're responsible for that. Um, so those are all the things that go through our minds as we're trying to make the decision in a moment like this. Maybe this was too soon to say anything about that, but I, it felt like the right time. But there we go. And, and, and if, if that shot is taken, I would want to immediately reach out. Actually, might even before the shot is taken, but immediately reach out to another uh, member zoo who have handled this situation successfully um, to find out um, what they were thinking or what what the circumstances are, um, were around it, so that we're able to better um, understand how to respond. Now, obviously, every region, every area, every zoo, and every um, um, uh, visitor and guest and supporter of zoos um, are different, but we would like to, my, my bigger thought process is always consistency. We want to be consistent. I like to be consistent within the organization. I like to be consistent within AZA as much as possible because consistency breeds a united front and it makes the messaging and each organization and the organization is more powerful. So um, I would love to make sure that I understand what another uh, institution has gone through so that we aren't, um, in messaging, we're not competing, you know, because if I say something that is, um, might be correct and get us out of the situation, it could then be, well, this other zoo did this um, and they were able to do that. Does that mean they're wrong? And that then becomes the conversation as 
as everything starts winding down, then all of these extra conversations of trying to push the narrative by media then starts unfolding. Thank you both. I really appreciate it. Um, we are coming down on our time where we need to go ahead and go down to Q and A. Um, one thing I did want to go ahead and relate to everybody is you're hearing from subject matter experts on their opinions, their opinions only. It's based on what they feel is the right decisions at this time. So when we open up questioning, we just ask that you respect the decisions that they've made and the questions really don't come as far as the decisions that they made during this, this game. The next thing I would like to say also is one of the main reasons why I came up with this game is I hope everyone here at the in, at different institutions will stop and think, imagine if you have keepers answering these questions. That's the whole thing is to make everybody think and have keepers think about the long term and exactly what needs to happen in these situations. And with that being said, um, things to consider for the game and once you're done is how different did each table outcome change? What were the things were common between each group? What things are different? I love to change up the roles. It gives you a huge perspective on what's happening. And definitely having a debrief is one of the most important things also, making sure you have those conversations on decisions that they made, how they feel that, that changed the scenario and how they feel about the entire situation. So with that being said, we wanna go ahead and open up for questions, Rob. All right, um, first question is, is any way that uh, copies of the documents will be made available? Um, Jeff, I think they were largely your documents, so I'm assuming that that would not be an issue, uh, sharing those documents. Yeah, we're definitely happy to share that and uh, people are can feel free to tailor the document to whatever supports their their needs of their institution, um, but it's a good jumping off point. All right. Um, that, Rob, I'll add on to that. So once we get the recording of this, we'll post the recording um, and the documents on the AZA network safety page so that everybody that's um, attended will have access to them as well as anybody who was not able to attend live. All right, and the next question I'm going to I'm going to toss to Dave. Um, the comment is interesting game. This is great. Involves learning and training. However, it's not a drill, correct? So the, the answer to that is um, a, a tabletop exercise does not qualify as an AZA required drill. Um, here at Shine Mountain Dew, as many as well as many others, use, we do additional above and beyond. Um, we document them uh, and log them in so when AZA does come to do their inspections they see them but you do need to have the required live action drills um you know one advantage of this that probably everybody was able to pick up on is it's easier to have a lot of different players involved in different opinions and, and inputs than you do in a live action drill where you're you're running through the zoo and you're reacting um, you don't always have your PR person there and be able to talk through that. So these are helpful in a whole different way, but they do not qualify um, as an AZA um, required uh, drill. Thank you, Dave. Um, we've got a couple of related questions here. Is, this all, is all this communication going through shared radio or cellular? Uh, is there prioritizing going on? Uh, and then is the animal ops manager ever the incident commander and how do you manage radio traffic between the two positions? Um, I can start off uh, by saying, at, at least at our institution, um, radio communication during an incident is consistently one of our big challenges um, because there is so much communication happening. We, uh, we call for radio silence on our channel um, and so what that means is that only critical communication is happening, which also leads to the question of what exactly qualifies as critical communication. Um, and so that typically is one of the learnings we get from our drills and, and leads to, you know, coaching and training in terms of, of what kind of communication people are providing. Um, and then in the, the second question, we don't ever have our what we call recovery coordinator or animal ops manager 
doing the role of incident coordinator or incident commander. Um, because as, as you alluded to in the question, it's just too much for one person to do and to do effectively. And so, um, you know, obviously I've worked at smaller institutions where the situation was, was different and we practice differently. Um, and so you have to tailor it to what resources you have available. But whenever possible, you know, we, we do it. And I think I would recommend um, separating roles as much as possible. I, you know, I think because each role becomes extraordinarily complex based on what's happening. And so allowing those individuals to have laser focus on what they're doing, if possible, can make your response more effective. Um, so I'll, I'll turn it over to the rest of the group with that, but I just wanted to share my thoughts on those. I'd probably like to piggyback off of that IC part. Um, remember that the incident command structure um, expands and contracts as your situation does. So you may be um, like, let's say a wallaby gets out of your wallaby yard. It's an animal escape for sure. Um, and you may be the incident commander and the animal recovery coordinator because you can do both of those roles. You're not shutting down the park. You're not calling for firearms. You're probably not calling to guest services in order to evacuate the park. Um, but as your, as your situation gets more complex, um, so does your incident command structure. And so it'll expand and you'll fill out those roles in order to be able to effectively um, navigate the conclusion of that, of that exercise or of that incident. And I'll, I'll piggyback on that as well. So one of the, the great things about the format of this game is it's, it's very simple and it can be set up to match the structure of your zoo. I've, I've worked at a few different zoos and um, at a smaller zoo, there were days where I was instant command and firearms. So sometimes in a smaller zoo, you are gonna be forced into situations like that. And you can make one of the rolls of your dice is that the firearms person and instant commander is the same person today. And that could be a roll of the dice and you could, you could definitely um, tailor the game that way. And on the communication piece, one of the things we talked about when we were doing our test run is it would be really fun to do this and have everybody be muted and you can only communicate via radio. Because in every live action exercise or drill that I've been involved in, the, the biggest choking point is always the radio. And this would be a way to practice that radio communication and figure out what is too much um, and, and what is the critical communication? Because if you roll the dice and say, okay, everybody go, and you start walking all over each other on the radio, that's what's going to happen in a real incident or in a real exercise or drill. So I, I do have interest doing that here with our team, playing this game. Everybody's in separate offices, and we roll the dice and talk on the radio. I think that would be great. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, how do you go over with the staff or debrief afterwards? Kelly, I'll toss that one to you to start. Um, the best way that I have found to do this is in an open forum, um, having everyone communicate just basically where they found problems, where they think problems are in the situation, how they feel the drill went, um, someone making sure that they're taking notes, someone making sure that wherever there was, we okay, well, we ran into a problem here, it's notated there and it's addressed later. Um, I think open forum for something like, mostly for the game, open forum is a great way to go over things because it, it handles a lot of questions that other people may have and it also handles situations that they're not sure about. Um, I think open forum is a way to go as well as written. Anybody else? I'll, I'll piggyback on that. We, we debrief immediately following every exercise uh, be it a small single team exercise or what we call our, our full scale or large scale exercise. Um, but then we also provide follow up information to the team in, uh, in the form of uh, typically a like a presentation or a write up that's given at, you know, our, our next, you know, all staff meeting. At least for us, everybody um, or every team uh, debrief. So there's different aspects of debriefing for us. So the comms team will debrief or PR team will debrief depending on how we handle that and, and, and um, 
the, the, the next route that we should take maybe, or think about maybe we dropped something or didn't think about something. Um, I'm sure um, operations, animal care is going to be debriefing themselves. And I believe that our management debriefs on their own to make sure that everything, um, when it comes to communication between the departments actually um, was the op most optimal it could be. All right. Uh, yeah, oh, just, right. I'd like to wait on that for just a second, really yeah. quickly, this idea of who's on the team. And frankly, there should be a grand unification of the whole institution uh, at some point when you do a, a, a live action drill. I feel like that's often the thing, and I can't say that we do that here. I'm just saying that we should, all of us should, um, because if you start to look at who's actually responding during an incident like this, it's a huge number. It's, it's perhaps almost the whole zoo, right? So there should be this, that, that last comment about a staff meeting. I think it should be a separate meeting, just about that, where we share, we come, we, we go out into our, our groups, we debrief there, and then we bring that information together into one grand unification of all members or all departments in the zoo or aquarium uh, to talk about these things. Awesome, thank you. Um, how often do you conduct drills, exercises when open to the public? And when you do, how do you communicate to guests that this is a drill? Uh, I know at Disney, we do not conduct our drills when the park is open to guests or in guest spaces. If, if we have a, a drill going on uh, during our guest operating hours, then it's being conducted backstage. I, I think just managing the public aspect of that is just a, a road that we have chosen not to go down. I mean, we obviously scenario plan and we have people play the role of guests. So we have, you know, some simulation of that aspect of it um, but we will we won't do it when we're open um rob i'd just like to piggyback on that and i, th I think it depends on the drill that you're doing so if you guys come from the central part of the united states uh, you probably um, experience uh, tornadoes um, and uh, your state uh, likely does a statewide tornado exercise um, and so one that you can easily do in conjunction with the state exercise is do a tornado exercise um, while they're putting off sirens, while you're trying to shelter people in place. Um, that's a good one for guests. Um, one, it reminds them that it's tornado season and that they, have, uh, they might want to learn more about tornadoes in their area. And it gives you the way, the opportunity to um, leverage what it actually looks like to shelter in place um, during an actual event. What we do is we, um, we write down on a slip, we give a slip to all of the employees and they have to say where they sheltered in place and how long it took them to get there. We know in a tornado you have between four and 11 minutes to shelter in place. And so uh, we might need to figure out if they, where they chose to shelter in place and how long it took them because they could be anywhere in the park when that, when that happens. And so with our guests, we just then also collect the data. How many guests did we, were we able to get in this building? Um, and then uh, we usually bring them in and then release them right away so that it's not impactful to the guest experience. We're not trying to hold them for 10 minutes until the sirens go off. Um, but it also gives uh, guest service staff and frontline employees a little bit of, uh, a little bit of skill to pull those people into buildings and um, even in a very short uh, number of minutes, they get to see kind of uh, how um, guests are going to respond to that. Normally when we invite guests in um, during a tornado exercise, um, they, they tend to participate um, and do it willingly. And so it's, it's just a great opportunity. Now, if you're doing a dangerous animal escape, I'm not sure that I would, I, I'm not sure how that, how that plays out. Uh, you need to risk assess that for your institution, but there are definitely times when we can do training exercises in front of the public so that they know that we're well-prepared institutions and then also that they can participate with us. Okay. Uh, I noticed that the form had an option to note that ICS was not employed. Uh, will you expand on those incidents where you would not utilize ICS? Uh, I guess I'll take that one too, uh, since I love ICS. Um, that form um, was originally uh, constructed um, 
a number of years ago when a lot of institutions um, had not adopted ICS as their command structure. Um, I think that largely um, institutions have selected ICS as their command structure. Um, it's a good way of communicating with your local law enforcement, your firearm or your um, fire department because they're using all of the same language as we are. Um, and so I would encourage you to use uh, the ICS structure every time. I think that that document was just meant to capture when people didn't use the incident command structure, um, but maybe use something else. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, do you ever involve local law enforcement or third parties as a part of your drills? Uh, and Andrew, we'll start with you. Um, I'll go ahead and let the others discuss the actual logistics of um, incorporating uh, local law enforcement or fire. Um, when it comes to the communication aspect of that, though, um, like I mentioned, uh, normally, yes, they may move over to a different radio signal, but media is crafty and they can find anything. Um, also, uh, piggybacking or adding to that, if, that question about it, do we communicate with guests regarding drills? Um, only if those drills, along with uh, involving um, law enforcement, if any of that spills out into the surrounding communities. For instance, um, we had a active uh, shooter drill at the safari park, and it required, I guess it requires some type of noise or blanks or something that, uh, that made it seem like we were having uh, live firearms at the safari park and the surrounding community was hearing all of this and wondering what's going on. So we were getting calls from media saying, we're hearing some weird activity happening um, at your facility. Could you let us know, are you guys safe? Are the people around you safe? And so um, for PR purposes, when it comes to things like that, we would first like to be prepared that, hey, this is going to happen and noises could be made so that we're not um, you know, taken off guard by that. But most of the time when we are doing law enforcement, we just wanna make sure that we know that this is happening so that we can uh, potentially look out and see if something um, could be an issue with the surrounding community and then we can take care of it. And we typically do, we choose one of our, you know, AZA required drills uh, each year to, to do as a, what we call a large or a full scale exercise. And that's where we involve our um, emergency response teams, you know, our, our EMTs, our local law enforcement, uh, other partners within the Walt Disney organization. Um, we do lots of drills throughout the year that are more team specific. Um, but once a year, we do do that, what we call full scale or large scale exercise in, in which we do involve uh, third parties and law enforcement. Um, I will say we're very fortunate here in that we have a security organization that has relationships with those. And so for me, that's that's as much as just picking up the phone and talking to them and saying, this is the one we want to involve them. And then they help coordinate that. So um you know, yes, we do do it. Um, we typically end up with about 60 or 70 people at that exercise, which makes it a little bit more challenging to manage. Um, but, you know, like I said, we just one, once a year we do that. The rest of them are all team specific. So there's a, uh, one thing I would add to that. The relationship that you have with your local law enforcement is critically important to establish well in advance of any incident, of course, and, th and that could be done like Rob, what you're saying, by drilling with them or involving them or having them critique what you do uh, and offer their expertise. Um, so those are, those are some of the things that we would want to do um, well in advance of anything happening is just having those strong relationships and an agreed upon uh, course of action if an incident does happen well in advance of that thing uh, happening. So um, you know, uh, basically you're trying to avoid the police from rushing in, uh, too soon, uh, or at all perhaps. And, and then, and having the police force feeling confident in your abilities to handle the situation is part of it. Part of that's also being able to evacuate your facility very quickly because if the public is there, their job is to protect the public. They may come in if we're not uh, doing a good job of, of uh, 
removing uh, the public from the situation. And then I would just remind everyone that um, law enforcement um, and your fire or your fire department are always looking for places to do training and um, your facility can help facilitate those kinds of trainings that they're looking for. So we start the conversation with our fire department by saying, what kind of training do you need to do this year? And what could we help you with? Um, and um, maybe they wanna do something in a structure. We, we had an opportunity this year uh, where we could do entrapment in a building that we were bringing down um, on the property. The timing didn't work out, but we've had that conversation with the fire department to see what kind of training um, that would be helpful for them that we could still do in conjunction with them. Um, you know, that would be like an employee uh, injury because they'd be trapped in a building that had collapsed on them. Firearm gets to, or fire department gets to use their um, their equipment, and we get to uh, do training with them, which builds really strong relationships. I would also recommend that um, all of your uh, police department and fire department have been through all of your dangerous animal buildings so that they have some familiarity with it. We're in a process right now where we're getting maps for the exteriors of our buildings that show what the insides of the buildings look like so that we can explain to emergency responders where animals are inside of the building so that they can enter the building with a high level of confidence uh, where, the, where they're going to expect to see an animal and, the, and where they're secured. And so I think that building those relationships is the most important thing, and we can do that through training together. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. Um, we've got two comments, uh, one from uh, Ann Knapp, who says she loves the game, would recommend any organization following ICS have at least one person take advantage of the HSEEP training. Uh, so thank you, Ann. I think that's a great recommendation as well. Uh, uh, and Wayne Lowmiller, uh, was thought the game was interesting, great collaboration on this topic, hope it continues. Uh, and so I say thank you to Wayne, we appreciate that. Um, and glad that, uh, you know, it seemed like it was a good, a good use of your time. Uh, and a couple other questions coming in. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to make weather drills fun and interactive? Uh, I'll turn that over to, to the group. I'm not sure I have any. I got one idea. You know, you could you could have it be Wizard of Oz uh, themed. You know, <laughs> you know, Auntie M, Toto, feet flying monkeys. I don't know. You know, just just have some fun with it. Uh, that there was the, that was supposed to be the comic relief for this. I don't know. That's one idea. Maybe maybe you do that. Um, Weather drills are a hard one. I mean, we we do similar to what Jeff was describing. We you know we sound the alarm so to speak, and we have people fill out a slip of paper indicating how long it took them to get to shelter. Um, but that, that, that is a hard one to make fun and interactive, I think, but I'm open to ideas. Um, I, I wish we had weather here to help. <laughs> I can't help you with any of that. So uh, and there are Department of Homeland Security grants out there that are attainable, and one of the requirements are participate in mass casualty training exercise. So that was just a passed on as an FYI. Thank you, Brent. Uh, and then another question, ideas on how to make participation more likely and voluntary. Uh, my team is often saying people over and over regardless of scenario. Um, I think in terms of, in terms of, I don't know how to make people feel good about it. I mean, we've, we've had, we did a lot, we've done a lot of work on, you know, encouraging role-playing and trying to make people live more comfortable with not, uh, you know, with actually going through the steps as opposed to just saying, I would do this or I would do that. Um, but it's a hard thing to get people comfortable with. Uh, in terms of making sure it's different people, um, our, you know, for us, again, I mean, we're a little bit fortunate, I guess, but, you know, I'm, the safety person here. So I'm independent of the animal care team. So, you know, when we're planning those large scale drills, I can move them around and I can pick the teams. <laughs> so, um, you know, we don't get that, that thing, you know, if we did an animal escape drill in our, with a tiger last year, we won't do that this year. Um, you know, if we did a guest injury in one area last year, we won't do it there next year, uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, that's how we 
sort of like I said, sort of move things around and make sure that everybody is getting the, the training that we feel like they need. Um, thoughts about announce versus surprise drills. Um, I'll start on that too, I guess. Um, our feeling is that as long as you are role playing and going through the steps that the drill can be effective, the exercise is effective as a training device. Um, and that there may be a whole slew of reasons that you would make a drill or an exercise announced versus unannounced. And you may slide back and forth on that scale. Um, if you have new animals in your collection or a new building, uh, you may want to announce that as people are still getting familiar with those animals or those buildings or whatnot. Um, if you have a highly trained, experienced staff that and nothing has really changed in their area, um, then I would throw it at them and, and make it unannounced. And so, you know, those are obviously the two extremes. Uh, and we, we routinely slide back and forth along that scale. Uh, depending on where we are with cast collection expansions changes whatever so um, again our emphasis is on actual role playing as being the real training piece of that not whether or not it's a surprise or not and then i'll just go right back to the scenario right if you have your goals outlined it'll help you determine whether you need to do it um whether you need to do it announced or unannounced so if if you're, if my goal for my fire evacuation is to test that everyone is well trained to the emergency procedures, then I'm doing a drill. I'm going to go pull the fire alarm and see how they exit the building. If my building is to, if my goal is to train them to make sure that they close all the doors behind them, that they know where fire extinguishers are, that they know where their evacuation area is, then I'm doing a training exercise. And so I'm going to I'm not actually testing that they that they know all of the key components to it. We've talked about them and then we're seeing if they can execute them and they're getting practice in it. And then after they get practice in it, then we drill them to see if they can execute the next time. So I think it's it's that semantics of of what you want to accomplish from your from your scenario that helps drive whether it's uh, whether it is announced or not. You can imagine if you're doing an animal escape um, and you want to see how all of the people react in real time under stressful conditions um, and uh, and um, what, what the actual response might look like, then you're doing a drill. And if you're trying to get people to understand what all of the moving pieces are um, and get um, some muscle memory with getting to the area and handling firearms, putting firearms away safely and all of those components, then you're doing the training exercise. So I think it's fluid. It goes back and forth. You just need to make sure that um, there's a lot of negative connotation to the word drill. And I think it comes from, oh, hey, I'm going to do a drill today. And people that um, haven't been properly trained don't feel like they've been set up for success. So do your training exercise first. Train all your staff get them well fluent in what's going to happen and then drill them. So Jeff, that brings us right up to, to 4.30, uh, which is our scheduled time. I wanna be respectful of the time commitment that everyone has made to join us. Um, and I will wrap it up there with a thank you to all those who joined us. Um, we are very glad that you elected to spend this time with us um, and hope that you found the time valuable. There will be a brief survey uh, as, the, as the session ends. And if you could take a few minutes to fill that out, we, we would be grateful. Um, I would also like to thank specifically Kelly and Jeff for putting this content together, uh, as well as the rest of our panelists for taking the time to play the game uh, and making it uh, you know, realistic and uh, enjoyable for everyone. So. Thank you all for joining us. I uh, hope you found it valuable and we will surely see you again in another one. Thank Thanks, you. Guys. Have a good day.